28. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. For Fishing the DMV to survive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 28 Patreon subscribers away from hitting our first goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders every month to Jake's Bait and Tackle. They'll be entered to win weekly prize giveaways, access to a private Facebook group community, and they'll also have access to Patreon membership only videos, live streams, and content. For more information, check the link down below or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have a really cool guest. Um, you know, this is the time of year that I really like to get my 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 biopics done, so to speak. We had one of the, the most famous episodes on the channel. I think it has over 2,000, 3,000 downloads. It was Charlie Taylor, who really was like a guy that, unless you're in the area, you don't know about him. And he has so many, just a wealth of knowledge and stories. And today I have on Kyle McCann, who I met through the old social media. And you guys would not you'd be shocked about this is how I find so many of my interviews because the people I try to find are those people that are in the area that really are part of this community. It's not the Iconellis. It's, it's not the Millikens. They're great. I'm not against them individually as people, but that's not what this show's about. It's about, you know, this community around here. And really we got a lot of fun things to talk about. So first off, Kyle, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thomas, thanks for having me. So you know, we're talking off camera here and it kind of got me really sized, but so we're gonna have to reiterate some of this stuff here. What got you into fishing and are, are you a local? Did you grow up in Virginia or what, what's really your story? Man, I, I can't remember a time when I haven't had a fishing rod in hand. Um, it goes back, I mean, generations for me. I grew up in Florida, um, lived there for 23 years of my life. I'm 32 years old now. Uh, my grandfather owned a, uh, bait and tackle store and was a rod maker in the keys when I was, you know, I actually never met him, but my dad's dad, my dad was a part-time captain down in the keys as well. And it, uh, fishing just runs in my blood, literally. Um, can remember like two or three years old, my Snoopy pole, my dad threw it out at the little pond near our house. And that first bass that I caught, I didn't even touch the handle. I just ran backwards and pulled the fish up on shore. And that memory has stuck with me for the rest of my life. And since then, I've gone through multiple other phases of, like, I, I love riding bikes, mountain bikes, gravel bikes, road bikes. Uh, you know, I've surfed a lot. I've done a lot of other sports, snowboarding, well, that side. Uh, done all kinds of outdoor activities, but fishing has been the one thing that has grounded me for my entire life. And it's been just this this thing that I, I can't, I can't get off of me. Like fishing just follows me everywhere I go and everywhere I go, I fish. It's been, it's been awesome. If I'm not mistaken, based on what you said, you grew up in the Florida Keys, correct? So I, I grew up in South Florida. Uh, my parents had a house in the Keys. So I was part of the Miami sport fishing club as a kid. My dad was a member. I was a member. Um, I grew up in the Fort Lauderdale area uh, and we had our house down there. Um, so between there and there, I fish Miami a ton, fish Flamingo, the Everglades, uh, a whole lot. Um, and then the keys, I mean, every other weekend in the summer, winter, fall, spring. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time in the keys as a kid. Mm. How, with that kind of lifestyle down there, how do you do indoor sports and how do you even get into freshwater fishing when there are so many freaking opportunities outside of freshwater? Dude, it's, I mean, the vast array of fish species, as everyone knows in Florida now, I mean, we've got, or they have some weird stuff down there. Same thing as up here, but bullseye snakehead up or down there. Bullseye. You've got the peacock bass. That's just so prolific. I mean, you can go, summer winter fall spring catch peacock bass my favorite spot for peacock bass literally a canal behind a walmart in fort lauderdale it's so like, freaking cool the amount of shit you can do down there is insane like i can remember in high school i'd stay on my kayak until like three in the morning 
and fish dock lights all night for snook. And I'd get to school at, you know, what's high school start at 7 38 AM and I'd be tired of shit, but I had it the time of my life. So the vast, you know, opportunities that Florida offered, if you liked fishing, you were set. I mean, freshwater, saltwater, brackish, anything. How did your dad get in and just really talk about that more? How did your dad get into guiding? Was that like a, a family uh, tradition thing or is that something new that he just he did or? I mean, I've, he and I are very much alike. Um, I wouldn't say I'm the biggest people person and fishing for both of us has been very much this thing where you rely on yourself for fishing, right? Um, I'm a very competitive person. I just got back into tournament fishing and, you know, the only person that you can rely on with competition where you are the sole person is yourself. Um, so for him, you know, like I mentioned, his dad owned a, a shop in the Keys and then a lot of his friends and friends of friends, when you're in the Miami Sport Fishing Club, it's one of the most prolific clubs in Miami or at least the South Florida area. A lot of guys are doing guiding part time. Getting a captain's license is pretty straightforward. So mm. it kind of fell into his lap between like loving the sport of fishing, loving competition, loving being able to see that smile on people's faces when you show them something that they've never seen before. Um, and then just honing the craft, like as, as the Florida Keys and the Everglades became the back of his hand, it, it was, it just made sense. How, and this is, I, we have to go down this rabbit hole with the keys and the Florida stuff. And I guess part one is how much has that changed from a cultural standpoint and the fishing pressure down there over the years? Cause it has to have changed dramatically. Yeah. My, both of my parents are from the Miami area. They're both from Hialeah. Um, they both grew up going to the keys as well. Um, you know, the, the flood of immigrants from South America, from different countries. Cuba, yeah. The Cuba, yeah. I mean, both my parents are born in the early 60s, so before uh, the flood came. Um, so English speaking in Hialeah was a thing back then. Now it's, it's you, you can't speak English in, in Hialeah. And the same thing goes for the Florida Keys. The same thing goes for the Everglades, which I have nothing against it, but it's brought much more pressure, certainly, to the areas. Um, a lot less... The unfortunate part is the conservation thing is not as, you know, important to some folks, especially people that aren't as knowledgeable. You know, if it swims, it dies is definitely a, a, a serious saying in South Florida. Um, so I think it's changed from the pressure perspective, but also the knowledge perspective and on both sides, for sure. I mean, you've got the guys that, you know, invest a, a boatload of money and sport fishing boats down there. You see those freaking 45 foot center consoles, even now up to like a 60 foot center console with six four fifties on the back. It's insane. I mean, the, the vast, you know, variety of people that fish now is just, it's exploded. That is a, it's a side tangent. Cause I am not a, a salt by, by blood. I'm always freshwater. And I've always understood the reason to have two motors on the back. Cause you want to fail safe when you go all the way out in the o oceans and animal It is not like these safe little lakes, but six feels like you're compensating for something. Is there an actual reason that you would want four five, six, seven motors? Or is it literally just cause you have the money? I mean, you said it, man. I, it, it's like an overly lifted truck, in my opinion. Gotcha. This is just okay. my opinion. It's a style um, thing. Yeah, I mean, these like, you know, the, the the Freemans, I don't know if you know Freeman Boat Works, but the, you know, the, what do they call them? The cat holes. You got mm -hmm. four motors on the back and these things are, are resell for $1.2 million. Guy, Nick Stanzik, uh, is reselling his every year. It's, you know, similar to a tournament guy. He's upgrading every year and his resale is above a million dollars for his boat. Same thing. I think Scott Martin's got the 42. That's that what I remember it from. Yeah. It. Yeah. It's, it's a million plus man. I, I think it's, if you got it, you get it. Yeah, That's a fascinating market to me. Cause I, I've always, and I just know this from, from dealing with vehicles and stuff where those higher ends, you just don't have to sell very many of them to break even. 
And I guess that's right. what, what they do because I just don't have, like, how, how big is that tournament scene? Cause it can't be like bass fishing where you have 300 boat tournaments all over the place. Yeah. It's not the Bisbee big bill. I mean, where you're cashing in a million plus like South Florida tournaments, you're cashing in maybe like a couple hundred thousand if you're lucky or like up here in Maryland, like the white Marlin shootout. Yeah. Sure. But those guys are fishing on like, I mean, the guys that are winning for the most part are on 70 plus foot, you know, Carolina boat or Viking, whatever production boat. Those guys aren't, they're not relying on tournament winnings. It's the same as bass fishing. Uh, I would say it's worse because the for amount sure. of petrol and it depends if they're using gas or diesel engines. I mean, yeah. then the crew size and all that other stuff, your numbers, your margins suck compared to bass fishing. I mean, that million dollars probably goes real quick. <laughs> You want to talk about burning some fuel, man. What was the thought I had about that? Okay, okay. Because the petrol thing, that to me is where I feel like that's killing the industry down there, especially when we've had these insane gas prices. I know when I used to go down there to do guided trips and things, like I, I just don't know how you make a living doing that. And then on top of that, the pressure I would think these places are getting from just a real estate market too. Like that whole way of life is just changing. And I saw that in the Florida Keys, Key West specifically, when I went down there as a kid versus when I got married down there three years ago, it's like, it's changed. A, it stayed the same, but it's changed a lot too, if that makes any sense. And oh, yeah. I really hope that way of life is so, the culture down there somehow stays alive. Yeah. That the Keys specifically has changed a lot. And the charter fishing there is, is taking a pretty big hit right now. Um, a lot of guys are sitting on the dock for days at a time when during the pandemic that would never happen. I mean, we're talking like within months ago, there are guys hurting now. Um, and even the, the real estate industry in, in the Keys, it's not the same as, you know, I'm in Richmond, uh, in my neighborhood, if a house comes for sale right now, it's still way over asking price. Like yeah. the keys, it's not happening. It's not happening anymore. So with that part of your life, like what was the, how did fly fishing really get into your repertoire? Cause I've always felt like that was more of like, especially in Florida. And this is just for, for what I've seen. That's like, golf it's like what the upper class does because it's not like trout fishing where you lit like that's what you do in trout fishing culture if you're doing red fishing snook fishing i never thought to into well you would catch them on a fly first that's what you do it, it just never comes into my mind so how did how did the fly really get into your repertoire yeah i'd say that i'd go back to the miami sport fishing club it was really? super prolific there i mean you've got different categories and the clubs like the Miami Sport Fishing Club have, uh, I'd call them like fun derbies. They're they're not even, you know, everyone goes out at the same time kind of derby. It's a yearly type of thing. You bring in a weighed fish or you bring in a measured fish and you go in a plaque or an award or, you know, multiple different award style categories. And fly was always a, a big category, especially as it related to like backcountry fishing. So like you mentioned, the tarpon is, it's probably from a saltwater perspective, tarpon is number one targeted fish with a fly rod for sure in saltwater space. And then, you know, a tailing redfish, there's nothing better than lightly casting a fly to a tailing redfish in a flood tide. Like it's on my gosh. You wouldn't do that with a spinning rod or a bait caster. It's just, it doesn't make sense. And that... Again, I tie it back to that and my dad having experience with that club and friends of friends and his close friends being in fly fishing, it kind of just transcended from there. That's so freaking cool. And then how, when did you, did you just recently leave Florida and you actually moved here to Virginia? Like how did that whole story pan out? Yeah. So, so I've been in, uh, I was in California for eight years. I moved there when I was 22 or 23. So 2014. Um, I moved there when I was working on private motor yachts and sport fishing boats. So out oh, of high school, wow. I, I, I tried college. My dad was firefighter. And then when he was not firefighter, he would do some chartering and captaining stuff. Um, I thought that that was going to be my route. And I decided I don't like blood that much. And, uh, I quickly, I, I found that out pretty fucking quick, hmm. uh, from, from there, I jumped on sport fishing boats, had a lot of, like I mentioned before, friends, 
friends that worked on sport fishing boats, friends that were in commercial, so on and so forth. And found my first job that was based in Jupiter where I went to high school um, and stayed in the the sport fishing and yacht industry, kind of like uh, if you've seen Below Deck on Bravo, my wife's one of her hmm. favorite shows, uh, similar to that. Uh, I worked on big boats and, and sport fishing boats. And one of those boats that I had worked on got sent through the Panama Canal and was headed to San Francisco. And I essentially just followed it over there and rest was history. I, I, I stayed in San Francisco for four years. Um, I literally jumped ship while I was in San Francisco and had an opportunity to get into something I'd always loved, which was storytelling, photography, writing, so on and so forth for a friend. And from there, it's it's been eight or nine years that I've been in mar- the marketing space, specifically in the outdoor industry. So so, so what, what did you have a passion for? How do you go from basically, you know, journeying around the world on a ship to I have this urge to become a storyteller and a photographer? Like, how did that break down? I have always loved taking videos. I, I, I'm sure I have it somewhere back here, but I, I've got like the first GoPro. I've got a GoPro 3. I've got multiple GoPro 7s, uh, the 11, a 12, big cameras, all that fun stuff. And I have always loved capturing the content or capturing the 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 moments that are happening for me uh it's super cool for me to look back at it and i've always loved the storytelling aspect of it so film the entire thing and then figure out a storyboard whether that be in video format or also you know in writing in actual words not something that people do anymore you know read that kind of thing um but I've always loved it. And I had a good opportunity with a friend of a friend. My story all revolves around networking and who I knew. Um, so I had an opportunity to jump ship and kind of just kind of transcended and went from there. Um, actually had contracts at, I worked at Facebook for a year. I worked at Twitter for a year. What and years I, was this context wise? Cause I know like, is this when it was X, when it's it's not X or like no, what's no. the time? Uh, frame? Yeah, I worked at Facebook in 2015, and okay. then I worked at Twitter in 16, um, and then in mid 16, I moved to San Diego, which I was there for four years until 2020, wow. and that's when we moved back to at least the East Coast in general. My wife is from Roanoke, and we decided we wanted to buy a house, so we landed in Richmond. So did you, were you in California during um, the pandemic or did you leave during or before? October 20. So pandemic started March 20. I've been remote work since then. And yeah, we literally literally packed up and we're like, dude, we want to get, like, we've always planned to get married. We've always planned to buy a house, have kids, so on and so forth. It wasn't happening in California, not at least from a comfort perspective. So Florida to California, which are pretty much when it comes to climate and just climate specifically about the same thing. So this is literally your first time with kind of the four seasons here in sad Virginia. Um, Holy, holy. What was that like from a cultural perspective and then the fishing perspective? Like when you segue to this area, because it's different. When we talked offline before this, I told you I've got some experiences and I love any type of fishing. I just love being on the water. You probably wouldn't guess what the first fish that I got attached to was, especially given what you just said. But I spent the first winter here only chasing muskie. Only. That makes sense, Solo actually. chasing muskie. <laughs> that fish to me was just this magical creature that I saw. And I was fly rod only for that fish. I keep saying I'm rod agnostic. But I put my head down and was like, I'm going to catch one of these big toothy sons of guns with a fly rod by myself. Well, with my dog, my dog comes with me fishing always, but I'm going to strip set, pull that fish in, drop the net in the water, do it all on my own. I fished the first winter that I was here. I bought, I bought a jet boat immediate, almost immediately when we bought our house, I had to have a garage. That was my one stipulation between Good. my wife and I <laughs> and uh, bought the jet boat, spent the entire winter chasing musky. I had 12 trips. I saw 21 musky. I, I had 21 follows and I hooked two fish, brought one fish to the net 
and I lost it in the net. What was that yeah. like when you strip it and you get that first hookup? Like that has to be almost like shell shock or buck fever. You don't believe it's real. Without a question, you don't believe it's real. It's, it's like, yeah. you want to talk about feeling like you hook into a log. <laughs> it is a log, dude. The fish that I lost, I, it was November 21. I went on a solo trip down to, um, what the hell's the river in Asheville? Uh, fuck, Jackson. I'm blanking on the name. No, Not Jackson. literally in Asheville. Um, it's like right behind. I don't want to say the exact spot where I was at, but there's one area called the Musky Mile uh, for the French Broad. Um, I went down there on a solo trip, slept in the bed of my truck. It was cold as shit. My favorite thing to do is get away from everyone and sleep in my truck and boondog for multiple days. And on that trip, that was the first time I'd seen multiple fish in a day. First stop was on the new. I saw six fish on the first day, drove down to the French Broad, spent three days there. And on the last day, in the last 10 minutes, I hooked that fish. Trolling motor was dead after fishing for three days. Didn't have a plug at the last place that I was sleeping at overnight. So I had like a half a day of a trolling motor. Good Lord. Throw my shit mushroom anchor in the water to hold me in this spot where I knew a fish was. And that was the devil. That was why I lost that fish. Because imagine you got current coming by you. You are the only thing that's in one spot. And that fish went downstream behind the boat. And I was having to drag him forward. So all of the pressure was essentially yeah. pulling the hook out of his mouth. As soon as I dropped the net in the water, he shook out. I literally I, cried. I, I actually cried. I don't know how you you net a muskie by yourself. I know there are some guys, I have some guides up here that I talk to a bunch and they're like, Oh, it's easy to do this. Like, I don't know how with the adrenaline pump and everything you keep pressure tight and then get this big, it's not even a net guys. It looks like it's to capture a hobbit. It's insanely big. It's ma it's massive. So, and to control that while keeping tension and you're fly fishing, which means you really need two points of contact to keep tension. Generally speaking. I mean, yeah, you can Mine's get fancy so with it, yeah. but Oh my God, dude, that's insane. It was heartbreaking. Um, I needless to say, I, the jet boat has been sitting for quite a while. Shameless plug. It's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a bass boat and have fully committed to fishing bass on the James or at least, you know, bass in general. Um, after that winter, I, I pretty much quit musky fishing and fully focused on smallmouth above walk-ins maidens columbia scottsville if anyone's aware of like the upper or at least like middle james um and really pushed on the smallmouth bug and now i'm i'm back into the bass world the the green bass world why make the switch accessibility uh i have a mm. 14 month old um dude is there's a lot to handle um i've got the Shit, I'm blanking on the name again. I've got a boat ramp eight minutes away from my house. Uh, it's in town, Ancaro's Landing. Okay, I can move my boat yeah. straight to Ancaro's. And in the spring, I can still tie into a you know spring run striper on the fly rod with a bass boat. I can still, it's I'm in an 18-foot aluminum boat, so I can still get like kind of into smallmouth territory, but... It's just accessibility for me and time is of the essence when you got a, a young one. I'm fascinated. I've um I've had a couple of guys on the show recently too, or I think it was like last spring talking about the Shad run down at the James. Um uh James River Fishing Reports. I can't yeah. pop that yeah, in my head yeah. here. Um that is such a unique area and the way if you wanted to do a documentary, that's something I would want to do eventually something like that about the way Richmond was 30 years ago now where it's like, it's an outdoor sports fishing Mecca and like 30 years ago. Phew, no, that's not what you would have thought of that place at, but it is flathead shad bass. It's insane. It's an unsung hero. I, I think that's why I landed here. I mean, we were checking out when we were moving back to the East coast, all different places in the DMV South of here, we were checking out Greenville, uh, Charlotte, Raleigh, so on and so forth. Richmond was a no-brainer for me. 
mountain biker, gravel cyclist, fisherman, the options for us are just, it's insane. Like Mm -hmm. I have a, a mountain bike trail two blocks away from me. That's the best in town. And I can loop in 12 mi- a 12 mile loop that I can do an hour, hour and a half. And during that, if I brought a fly rod with me, I could go catch a small mount. Mm-hmm. It is, the options are amazing. What type of fishing opportunities are there? Let's say, let's start with this time of year and work into the spring that are a little bit more off the wall. Um, the, the shad run, of course, everyone knows about. Is that usually what we stick to? It's just the James proper? Yeah, in the in the spring for sure. You know, you're talking March, April for the shad, and then we get into like April, May, June for the striper. Um, and everything's mixed in there during that time. As you probably know, the Potomac is heavy on shad as well. I mean, you can catch them in DC proper; it's insane. And any river that's coastal, mid Atlantic, has got shad, right? But that's that's definitely our our main target come March, April going into May and then moving into following up with like the, the striper run, um, you know, right in town. But then even like where I'm at, I can go walk down. There's a bridge called the nickel bridge. I'm like a 20 minute walk. I could walk from there down to the, down to a nice little spot where there's, I mean, it's stacked with smallmouth. Um, in town is, it isn't bad smallmouth fishing, to be totally frank. Um, and then we've really? got some, we got a decent largemouth population in town. Um, and that's all above the fall line. And, you know, musky, if I'm going for musky, I've got to get above Lynchburg for sure. But mm-hmm. right here in town, uh, we're talking smallmouth. I mean, and it's, it's pretty damn solid. That to me is just absolutely fascinating. Like, like how that's the water quality has increased there, but there's also like there's lakes around you too, right? Cause you have like Swift Creek reservoir, Lake Chesden. That's not yep. too far away as well. Yeah. And, and back to like why I kind of moved away from the smallmouth and the muskie. I, again, I, I'm a very competitive person, dude. I, I fish in a freaking, or I, I, I play in a kickball league <laughs> and I get so pissed that I've almost been kicked out of multiple games. Like, I'm an incredibly competitive person and moving to green bass fishing has given me so many opportunities to flex that competitive nature. And it's, it's been so fun. I've met so many really, really cool people, so many passionate people about bass fishing and the history on the James is just, it's it's wild. Like it is, it's badass. Like, my, my wife's family's out in Roanoke still, and they've got a sailboat on Smith Mountain Lake. So I go out there whenever I can as well. But like you mentioned, local to here, Lake Anna's only hour and 15 yeah. from us. We've got Chesden for me is like, it's like 40 minutes. Um, and then the James, the chick, everything's within like, I, I can get to that one ramp in eight minutes, but I don't, I'm not fishing out of that. Um, but Osborne, I can get there in 25 and that's where I'm usually launching out of is Osborne. And then I'll run down to like highway five to the chick and, you know, I'm fishing mostly like this year I focused on the cat trail, the James river, um, oh, the cool. summer series and the fall series. Um, I, I can't say I did very well. I fished a tiny little derb on Saturday. I actually, first time I blanked bass fishing in. I can't remember. It was Happens embarrassing. Everyone. Honestly, it was embarrassing. Yeah. What, what um, what was the biggest learning curve like hopping into bass tournaments? And if I'm not mistaken, like, is this your first? Was this your first year full bass fishing tournament wise? From a boat, yes. Okay. Um, I fished kayak tournaments when I was in Southern California. Um, hmm. I worked for a, a media company in Southern California. That's why I moved down there. One of the publications was Kayak Fish Mag. Um, it's cool. kind of like, it's a, a different version of Kayak Angler Mag. It's actually older than Kayak Angler, but um, they're they're no longer in publication or even digitally native. Um, but I had the opportunity to be the editor as kind of like a, a part-time thing. So getting kayaks in for review was part of my role. And it just, it moved me into like, let me figure out the scene here. And I jumped into a couple of tournaments in the uh, name. Was it the, the SCKA Southern Southern California kayak anglers tournament series. 
they were like a subsidiary of KBF. Um, it was, that was my first adult experience in tournaments. And now this is my first experience as a boater this year. What has been the biggest change? I'm going from kayak to boat. Hmm. Accessibility has been amazing. Um, I was launching, you know, in a, in a kayak tournament and you could cover four miles. At least for me, I was in a Hobie pedal drive. You cover four to five miles in a day. And that's, that's pushing it with the out of Torquedo without any motor. Four to five miles is a, a pretty vast amount of space that you can hit. Then I moved into the jet boat as my first boat when I bought, when I moved here. That thing goes like on a good day down river, 20 miles an hour max. It, up river, it's moving like 15 miles an hour. So I'm not going far in that thing. And now, like I mentioned, I'm in an 18 foot aluminum rig with a 115 Suzuki on it. Like I'm not hauling ass or beating any you know, Phoenix 21 foot boat, but I can get to places now. I can launch at Osborne. I can get down to Hopewell in 15, 20 minutes. So accessibility to locations is a game changer, man. Like the amount of area, the the sheer amount of space that I can hit in one day is just, mm -hmm. it's wild. It really is. And that's where it comes like decision overload. Um, when you're in a kayak, it really does force you, whether you're, you know, using a Torquedo, a pedal drive system or whatever brand that you enjoy, you, you are still locked into an area. Generically speaking, when you throw a 250, a 115 on the back, all of a sudden you have this paralysis mentally of like, I can go anywhere and I should, <laughs> is that something that you, you felt? It was a change. It was definitely a change. I, I mean, my experience on Saturday, like I mentioned, when I blanked, um, I sat in, you know, if anyone's fished out of Osborne or the James in general, during the winter, you fish the barge pit. I sat in the barge pit all day, 8 a.m. until 3.45 when I had to run back to Osborne. I didn't, I didn't have a single fucking bite all day. <laughs> I had 10 rods on the deck, swapped out multiple different things. I mean, I threw the A rig, I threw a lipless, I threw multiple different uh, crankbaits, flat side, regular square bill, a jig, a spinner. Dude, you name it, I threw it. The freaking live scope screen was lit up with fish. Mm -hmm. and I think I was chasing gizzard chat all day. <laughs> it was, it was yeah. a joke. But... I mean, regardless, most of the time I'm bouncing around, like, you know, I'm either chasing the tide or hitting those high percentage spots, but I decided to do something totally different off the wall and not move the entire day. It didn't work. I think there is, it's a mental game when you have the options. So it's, it's good and bad. It, it really is. And I think the people that can bounce between kayak fishing and, and boat fishing are just, they're, they're a different cat to be able to have those two things that they can work on together in their mind, two different demons, so to speak. Are, are you still in the, in the outdoor industry or did you make a complete career shift? I made a complete career shift about a year ago. I now work for an Italian coffee company. So I'm in the CPG industry. Um, so different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I've been in digital marketing or at least brand marketing, mending the two together for the past, my entire career. Uh, my previous job, I worked at Smith Optics and then I was at Canyon Bikes for three years and then a media company for almost three years as well. That was outdoor specific. Um, I can say the outdoor industry is not going to pay you what <laughs> most other industries like tech or CPG or businesses that have money. Are gonna pay you they give you all the perks and they tell you everything's great because you get 50 percent off of everything but 50 percent off a fishing rod or a pair of waders doesn't pay my bills is that because of the size so i've always thought that it comes down to two things is it the size of the industry or competitive so i was always told you want to find a boring job with a big corporation versus if you work in a fashion industry because they know we have ten thousand people wanting to work for us and we don't care about you because we'll find six more is it kind of, doesn't. yeah, I was going to say, I, is it, I, that's what my thought is, is that it's easy to find people that are willing to take 
lower pay for a passion driven job, but mm. passion doesn't pay the bills again. Like I'm, I'm happy to, to, I mean, my number one goal in life is to be satisfied with life. Like money's not going to buy everything, but the guy that says money that, that is really serious about that has never owned a boat or never bought fishing tackle and had no issues with, you know, going into a store and just saying, fuck it, I need to buy it. Uh, but regardless, like money is still important, right? Like I'm not going to go make, and I hate to say this, like $50,000 a year and work at, you know, the coolest, like I'm not going to go work at Yeti just because it's a cool company and make pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense for me. I'm undervaluing, undervaluing myself. I, yeah, I think that's a big issue with a lot of people is is they try to chase this illusion of what people try to sell you. And especially and this is within the industry too. This is in baseball too. I mean, I think the biggest corruption is like how they put the Little League World Series on and it's like, this is the coolest thing. Don't you want to be like this? And it's like, it's I, how much money are they making off those kids? And it, like, it's just a crock dream, but it's the same thing in the outdoor industry too. It's selling that dream. It's nuts. Yeah. It, it really is that kind of mind shift that a lot of people, they end up getting smacked by it. Like I, I got smacked by it eventually where I was saying to myself, like this job's amazing, but between like the disorganization at my last company and the, the pay gap between outdoor industry and any other industry, I, I've made the commitment to say work is work and fishing's fishing or passion's passion. They're, they're separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with you. What, what things in this area now that, now that you're, yeah, you know, you're a native, so to speak, that are you going to try to get, get done or on your bucket list? Cause you have the Chesapeake Bay, you have the Potomac river, Shenandoah new, like there's so many things. Do you have a bucket list that you're starting to formulate in your head? That's a good question. I mean, next year I really want to go pretty hard into tournament fishing. Um, I'd really like to focus on, well, I don't want to be a boater in BFLs. I'd, I'd like to spend an entire season potentially between Shenandoah and the Piedmont division as a co-angler. Nice. Um, I have a lot to learn. Like I love learning on my own, but I have found I've only fished three or two or three tournaments as a co-angler, but I've got a lot to learn. I fished that little five guy derb on Saturday. The guy that won had 18 and a half pounds. I mean, dude, I literally blanked and got zero bites. If I get connected with that guy and just can learn one thing, one thing that changes my entire way of thinking about fishing the James or mm. fishing the Potomac or fishing Smith Mountain Lake or Lake Anna, any of those, dude, that's a win for me. Like that is my bucket list. Like I mentioned, I'm a, like my wife is scared of how competitive I am. Like I say that lightly because I heard her just come inside. Um, but like, I really want to do something with tournament fishing. Like I, I'm lucky to have a job that supports my passion and I have Chasing enough dreams. money to, yeah, I, I have enough money to like, throw it away unfortunately <laughs> like i hate to say it like right now i'm i'm literally throwing money away at these tournaments i am the guy that's donating i hate to say it like when i hear of people like there's this you know back half of the the tournament standings that all these guys are donators right now i'm a, I'm a donator i'll call myself out i don't want to be a donator come 2025 though no, and I just find it interesting because I've always wanted to get more gleam from people that that really just want to be co-anglers and just get their mindset on that. Is there anything in particular that you think you could gleam actually from being in the back of the boat? Well, I might have to rephrase it a little bit. I don't want to be a co-angler. Well, yeah, yeah. I like fishing. I really have enjoyed fishing the cat trail. It's been super fun. It's the first tournament I fished was at a Hopewell. There was 51 boats. Like, that was the perfect size for me. I'm not forced to have another boater with me. And caveat, I I'm only fishing by myself. Like I want to only fish by myself if I'm fishing a derb um, as the boater. But yeah. on the co-angler side, like 
if I could learn just the way of thinking of, of rotation or decision making or, you know, selection based on conditions, like I think I've got things at least like somewhat figured out. Like for for my birthday, I got a, a subscription to Bass U and dude, when I'm when I'm driving or when I'm in the shower, I'm watching Bass U. Like the the most recent stuff that came up with Mike Iconelli of the top three winter soft baits, the top three hard baits, like I've consumed all of it. I listen to podcasts consistently to understand better things about conditions, about decision making, positive mental attitude, all that stuff. Like I if I can glean one thing from every tournament, I think in the next year I'd be okay with shelling out double the amount of money on a boat and moving into BFLs as a as a as a boater and maybe even something different. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing is you just can't beat the ten thousand hour rule in fishing because it's just there's so much of it that is a textbook that you read, but then so much of it is just you experiencing all the conditions. And that's the hardest thing is that corner. You can't cut, you can't cut the fact that how you actually been out there when it was 30 degrees and it was bluebird. Cause you can read about it. And just because they said they're going to bite that section and swim bait, you find out like, no, nah, that's bullshit. They're not going to do that today. <laughs> yep. Um, and I've also learned a lot of times like the best things that can happen or that you should be doing won't be mentioned, uh, on shows, sadly. Um, no. But, but you got to go out there and experience it. And Carl Jogason is a great example of that too, where you know, dude went over from Australia, came here. And he's like, I'm just going to fish every damn day. And he got, I think uh, BTL talked about that a long time ago when Mark Jeffries was on the show, but they calculated out that he got in five years, the same amount of experience and time on the water as somebody that fished 20 years here on the weekends. Nice. And it's insane, but it's idea like he cut down that 10,000 hours and you get the reps in all these bodies of water and Dude, talk about these eq guys like jt tompkins mm -hmm. like he is on what is what did they what has he been saying he's on the water 320 oh, days a year it's 350? Stupid. come on you can't tell me right now that the reason that that guy is winning tournaments or the reason that he qualified was because of live scope i'm sorry like i've been stuck on these rants this Randy Blockett shit fighting with Milliken like that was staged. That was one hundred percent staged. I mean, opinion. even even just the conversations that Blockett's had for the past, what, I don't know how long he's been talking shit about Live Scope for, but like you can't tell me that these guys that are in the up and coming elites that are moving up that they're here solely because of Live Scope. It's it's not possible. I, I, I consider myself an amateur historian, a military historian, and really it, this is no different than when, than when, um, side imaging came in and you had the guys that got on the technology first and they were saying, it's like, well, you can't just say that they're winning because of this. My point is like, no, they were just intelligent enough to get on it first. If you were a guy that decided like, you know what? A musket's bullshit. I like this thing that has a magazine. You don't just blame like, well, that's the reason you're winning the war. It's like, no, you are intelligent enough to see. I need to do this thing and get good at it. That's called life. I mean, excellent comparison tactic. I, I mean, imagine if we still fought wars where these yeah. guys you walked up to each line other, up. fucking a trumpet. Yep. And all of a sudden we started shooting at each other still. Would that work? No. We are humans, dude. We evolve. Mm -hmm. like, why are people arguing just a bit? I hate that I'm we're moving into live scope and we don't have, we can get off of this, but I hate that live scope is the devil right now. It's so frustrating. And uh, yeah. And that's it's such an interesting thing. Cause we've had this problem before when it's gotten worse though, but here's the thing. And this is where I would, I wanted to do a kind of a historical deep dive. And this guy's will be on the show about the reason this was an issue for, for side, for side, uh, side scope. Wow. For uh, side scan is Facebook and YouTube weren't as hot back then. They weren't sure. as big when that came in. And the bastards and all this other stuff, media 100% plays into it. And we're in that perfect time where you can stoke no fire. Yep. And I really think that's what it is because these same conversations were happening when that stuff dropped down. It was. It just wasn't amplified. Newspapers were the devil? Yep. I don't because I wasn't alive, but that was a thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how many years ago it was, but media used to be the devil and that used to be based on freaking newspapers man 
Like, I, why are we drawing the line at live scope? Why aren't we talking broader? Why aren't we just being positive? I mean, this is what our conversation started from was like, I hate that so much of the fishing industry, at least from a media perspective, is is really fueled by negativity right now. Like there is a lot of positive shit in fishing. Like you can mm -hmm. you can be this like brand new angler, go to Walmart, buy your piece of crap, you know, black max abu abu combo for under a hundred bucks, buy a pack of Sankos, and you're gonna catch fish. I can guarantee anyone you're going to catch fish. And you can fish from the bank. You don't need anything. For me, I could go to Bird Lake down the road and catch a fish. Simple as that. Or you could buy that $154,000 icon because you can afford it. Don't be an idiot going to mega debt, but there's a market for that. There's guys that can afford it and that's for them. The controversy thing is you being in media marketing, you understand that that stuff sells and that will trend on Facebook 100%. And I think that's amplified even more so now, I would love to think that it is possibly changing the algorithm. I know they changed the algorithm up without telling us, um, especially with my insiders at the old YouTube that have told me so. So I think they amplify a lot of that stuff. And you couple that with the fact that I think this happens in every industry, honestly. It's just the industries you're closer with, it hurts more, I guess, when you see it. But it, I don't know why there's more division now. And it has just because the echo chambers of social media which I know I'm gifted with the platform right here and I'm going to talk shit about it, but it is, it's something where if I have a kid, yeah, I don't know if you're going to get a phone to get on this stuff until you're older. Cause it's bad. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the algorithm is based on engagement, right? Yep. Like we can sum it up as like, let's say it's Instagram. You get saves, you get shares, you get comments, you get likes. It's the equation. It's very, very simple. They may start to weigh it based on shares more than saves or vice versa, but, it's, it honestly is not fucking rocket science. Like if you trigger someone and negative information always triggers people, the algorithm's going to favor you. It's, it's, it's that easy. And people like to argue. I mean, this is no difference in sports talk yeah. radio. People will bitch about the Redskins and they're the Redskins guys, not the commanders. Uh, they'll complain about them till the cows come home every day, but their passion. And I think that's the other thing too, is like, is it negativity or is it passion? And, I, and that's where I think it's hard that we need to always step back when you look at things. Um, you know, when Randy Block at first made content, I thought like, okay, there's some passion there. Maybe that's all it is, but it's when it's every video, then it's like, hmm, no, is this a grift? I don't know. Uh, I just, yeah, th that to me is absolutely fascinating. You probably know this a lot better than me. What is communism is that you essentially just all you want is for things to be the old way. Communism. Well, yeah, if we want to get on a historical in thing the root of it, in the root of it, there's a lot of it defined by. We're we talking about wanting... Trotsky communism, Lenin communism or Stalinist communism, because it all depends, me, I guess. But. There's, there's a root that says, essentially, you just want things to be the way that they were. You don't mm -hmm. want things to change. You want them to stay the same. Like that's To me, that's all I hear Randy talking about. And he's triggered me. Obviously, we're talking about him right now. And, and that's the baseball mindset, too, though. Baseball has had this huge issue about not wanting to move forward in the smart way. Because it's like, well, we did this 300 years ago. It's like, yeah, but it's 2023. Like, we do need to make some adjustments. Um and I do think at some point, this is a conversation I want to have. Maybe we do need a technology like, like when will we cut it off? Should we? I know a little bit about taking a photograph and I know optics. When you have 38 graphs on your boat, what's the optic you're sending to people? I, I get it. It sells, but it's also you are pushing people out of the industry. So, I, yeah, I've got nothing against limitations, but I mean, it can't be just black and white like this is not allowed period yeah that, yeah because i had people say that before it's like well we shouldn't we should we, you know we can't do that it's like well the bassmaster classic everyone got the same boat and had to weigh their tackle so it's not like this is a new thing and, and i get it that's who's the big sponsors um but all sports need some kind of limitation i just think it's so unique because this is more like nascar than baseball where there's such a technology thing i was gonna say that yep yeah it because it, it is it's but nascar has limitations they understood correctly where this would go if it was just unlimited 
Yeah, no, that's a totally valid point. I mean, you know, any from the ground level up, like racing is a good example. Crate motors are a big thing in stock car racing, short track racing. Like that's a, a known thing. Like you don't want this guy that is, you know, me, I, I don't have enough money to compete in racing, but if I had at least a little more money, maybe I could buy a crate motor and a decent chassis and compete because in this specific category, you know, everyone's on the same level playing field. And you're right. You know, I, I don't know how long ago it was, but when everyone had the same boat in the Bassmaster Classic, like there was a level playing field. That's absolutely true. What do you think about, um, since you were a kayak angler first, what do you think about what Hobie did from a brand standpoint saying we're a pedal drive company, but now we're going to allow electric, electric motors. It's, it's a bold that's, strategy. That's an interesting one. Um, honestly, till just now, I mean, I've thought about it before. Um, but like thinking about it from a argumentative perspective, or at least an opinion perspective, it's interesting. That's what I, I thought. A different thing, right? We're talking about um, the limitation being like sheer muscle, as an example. Like you can pedal so far, you can only pedal so far, but when you add this thing in there, you can pedal or at least travel double the distance. Whereas you compare like side imaging to live scope, it's like it's not the same comparison. It's all technology at some point. I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like when we talk about transportation, it's it's a little new, more nuanced and different, maybe. I really feel like with corporations, and this is kind of what I got working for corporations and when I got my MBA, there's this strive to always worry about the customer you don't have instead of worrying about the customer you do have. And the one I wrote a paper on the whole time was the Chick-fil-A effect, where Chick-fil-A does not market as hard as McDonald's or Coca-Cola. But their idea is we're just going to take care of the customers we have. And they wouldn't go out and be like, by the way, we're getting our butts kicked on the burger market. So we're going to stop selling as much chicken and go to beef. And that's the interesting thing with Hobie. It's like you sell the kayak that revolutionized the pat the pedal industry. Make one with a trolling motor and sell it to the other people. But this is your niche. So are you going to alienate the people you do have? It's just, I, it's like, I'm, I would love to talk to them about what their thought process is margin wise. Like, are they going to really gain more than they lose? But there's this boogeyman of like, well, you got to compete with bass for saying like, you could just have your niche in the market and just be happy. I mean, especially when you have your own series. I mean, that's the thing that's so BOS, weird. And it's dude, people want to be on the BOS. Yeah, it is. It, at least it was the premiere. Yeah, it, it's just it's so weird when you when you're a company that owns your own series and bass is not a company that owns. Like, it's just I don't know. I've just I thought that was such a weird out of left field thing. But yeah, I don't that's. Know. That's an interesting point. I mean, I, I have never experienced a Torquedo or any motor driven kayak. I, I love the pedal drive and even more so I love the 180 with the mm -hmm. reverse. Like that was revolutionary to me. I've never used the 360 drive, but I thought it was amazing to pull a trigger and be able to go in reverse, especially with the paddle style. And I've, I've been on multiple old towns where it's, immediate reverse you know the i don't know what the nomenclature for it is but the bike pedal version versus yeah. the paddle version um but from my perspective paddles are much better than pedals at least speed wise certainly i had a couple of people reach out and be like well i don't really need to get a hobie now i can go get this other one that's cheaper and just get a torquita thrown on it and it's like so it's like well <laughs> And again, guys, I, you're, like, you're talking in the comment section what you think is like, I just feel like I would love to know if I get so if you're listening, Hobie, what do you think your margins are going to be now? And how many people are going to be like, I don't need a Hobie now to fish your tour necessarily. I just get a motor. But I don't know. That's some of these decisions are fascinating. Yeah. You look at a company like uh, Bonafide as an example. They hadn't had, uh, I don't even know if they offer a pedal drive still, but their costs are a hell of a lot higher than any other non pedal drive kayak period mm -hmm. i mean new canoe is the same thing i i'm not a huge fan of their drive system it's kind of strange a lot of contraptions in it but i mean they owned the market as a 
you know, sit inside or sit on yeah. top kind of conversion style. And it was a, a really cool concept, but like, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. I haven't thought about that on the Hobie side. Since you have so much experience in the industry, I mean, what are your thoughts on where things are going right now? I mean, the world doesn't look like it's in a great state. So will it follow the same track or is it going to do something different? I, I, I've thought about it a lot and compared it um, to when I was, where I was at when the pandemic started. Um, I worked for a bike company at that time. I worked for Canyon Bikes. Um, we had recently entered the US market. It's a, a German company. So we were about a year and a half in at that point. Um, and we were direct consumer only. So we were the first of the first to be direct consumer do still to this day, do not sell to any shops. Um, but when the pandemic hit, we had the bike boom. It was the yeah. same thing as in fishing. I mean, yep, yep, yep. everyone got into the outdoors and, you know, one thing happened, which we all know of is everyone flooded to purchasing things. And it was that boom where you might not have been a kayak fisherman or you might not have been a cyclist, but you might have you probably tried it out during the pandemic. And, and interest rates were like zero. And our inventory level, like normal inventory on hand, which was a terminology for us, was around 2,000 bikes at a time. We had a point within the first couple of months of the pandemic where we went down to 150 bikes on hand. 150 bikes on hand. Normally we would have you know, multiple millions of dollars in inventory. We were under a million dollars at that. I mean, we were at like tens of millions of dollars in inventory. And then we were under a million dollars within the first couple of months because demand skyrocketed. Supply chain. Yeah. There, it, there wasn't such thing, period. There, there wasn't a supply chain. Our factories in Taiwan were multiple times got shut down. We had factories in Taiwan and India all of them had multiple periods of shutdown. So we're seeing the same thing. And I'm, I'm getting to a point here where, you know, we ordered inventory, we started to forecast and we tried to cut out, we tried to cut out what we expected demand during uh, the pandemic. Like we, we wouldn't forecast based on 2020 or 21. So we would look at like 19, 18 in sales during that period. And we'd say, okay, let's normalize with the trajectory of a kager of like 20%. So that's growth of around 20% versus previous year. And, you know, it still kept happening where inventory would get messed up. There's multiple suppliers involved when you think about a bike. And same thing with like a boat. You're not building everything in house. Like mm -hmm. you got a motor, you've got you know, a jack plate, you've got hydraulic steering, everything's from a different guy. And a lot of stuff's not made in the USA. So you got this influx of inventory that came back and we're seeing it now. I mean, this inventory is, it's sitting, right? I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not the only one seeing it. Um, so to the, I mean, more to the point, I, I think that we're going to start seeing some small mom and pops at least that have put a lot of dime into what they're doing or at least put yeah. all of their bets on a single business and haven't diversified run into trouble mm -hmm. which is it's <clears throat> i hate to say this, this is not like this is something that could happen at any point diversification of income is a key to you know financial power right and during a recession, we're not, I don't even know if this is technically a recession, but like during a recession, you better be smart about where your income's coming from. And I think a lot of these mom and pops, or at least people that haven't been smart about evolving are going to have issues. And cons on the consumer side, like we, if you're a company, you bow to the consumer, right? Like the consumer tells you what you're going to, what you need to do. And I don't think the consumer is going anywhere for the fishing industry. Like, tell me if I'm wrong, but why would fishing, a recreational first sport, one of the most popular 
sports in the entire country, or at least rec activities in the country, is going to just disappear. That that I don't think is going to no, happen. No, no, I don't think it's going to disappear. I think it's going to be a top down issue. I mean, again, I would I would love if I ever have time. Another thing I want to do is a video about trying to reflect the the housing crisis of 2007, 2008 till now to compare and contrast the industry to see if there's any kind of, or is there any signals? Um, but from what I remember and the people I've talked to, it affected the upper percent more or less. You know, Walmart kind of left, um, the insurance companies, like all these big sponsors kind of left the industry when the housing, the housing crisis hit. And so I think if we do have another recession, I don't think we're in it yet because the job numbers aren't there yet, but we're teetering. It's going to hurt the top half first. I think, yeah, your 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 kid down the street and his dad, they're gonna go fishing, but they're probably not gonna spend as much. And I think I think it's going to be regional based. And this is something where when I have people on the show and being a Northern Virginian, we don't get hit with shit. <laughs> we just don't. Yeah. Because of DC, like our area is such a weird ass bubble, we're gonna be protected. But Southern Virginia, you know, like outside of the Richmond area, maybe near Smith or, or like I I don't know. Like that's what's gonna be interesting is I remember, you know, when I was in high school and we would, we traveled down and you get to see some of these areas in the Carolinas and Alabama and like, they got, they got hit hard by that stuff. And it's kind of a, it's, it's a delusion because when you grow up in this bubble, you think, oh, everything's fine. People are overplaying it. But when you leave the bubble of of DC, then you realize that, okay, this is, we don't, I don't live in the real world necessarily. And so I am going to think it's regional based if the bottom does drop out of what happens. But when you say regional base, are you talking fishing industry specific or are you saying like poverty in a specific region? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking because I think I think like one chases the other. Like I think if you have a recession that will affect everything, all industries, not just the, the outdoor, I think college towns are going to be a little bit more safer. I think D.C. government areas are going to be kind of safe. I think the Richmond area is going to oh, be kind of safe. Sure. Yeah. Outside of that, when you get into like the the deep south that's going to get hit hard and so i think if you diversify where you're in if you're a guide service in the potomac river you're probably going to be a lot safer if, if that kind of makes sense but i think it comes it's a lot more nuanced than that right like people may not be able to spend on a guide trip like if you've got a uh, you know a list that is a mile long and you've got repeat customers and you don't have to call anyone to get a trip as a guide. Like, I don't know about that guy. The guy that's coming up net new doesn't have a YouTube channel, doesn't have an Instagram following, like doesn't have a diversification of his, you know, his background or, you know, himself as a brand. Like he, he might have some trouble taking money from people. Um, and I say that lightly, it's not taking money from people, but getting people to pay him to do something. Yeah. Um, I mean, established brands are always going to do better off than somebody that's just up and coming. Um, I mean, they have, they have a hard enough time in a good, a good market. Um, I, I think there'll be a pullback, but then it's like how bad of one. Yeah. I, and I, I yeah, even, who think knows? It's, it's, it's super nuanced to think about like beer or alcohol during a recession. What does alcohol do during a recession? It, it has a damn good time. Alcohol sales during a recession are very great. But al- alcohol, people, prostitution, people, like that shit always does well. Like, <laughs> and gambling. Those are the three. We've got to, I mean, if we're talking fishing industry or at least tournament industry specifically, okay. we got a, a decent bit of, and I'm getting to a broader point too. We got a decent bit of sponsors that are alcohol related, or at least like, oh. you know, tobacco related, and things that maybe our our wives don't like us doing as often as we should or as we do. Um, but the point, the the closer point here, alcohol moves up during a recession. People want to get outside when they're depressed as well. Like, sure, it's hard to get off the couch when you're not feeling great and you're down and not on good luck but fishing's a it's a it's an at least for me like i can openly admit like i've been depressed in my life and like fishing is one of the key ways for me to get out of a hole i think fishing is an interesting wreck thing maybe not the tournament side but the recreational side of fishing it's an interesting category same with like cycling like 
or any fitness category. I do think that's a very good distinction you have to make is compare and contrast the the tournament guy versus the guy that goes out fishing. Um, yeah, I think that's very valid because I do think it, of it, everything can get too expensive. And so I think there's an asterisk on how much tournament fishing will get affected by a, a collapse. I mean, it did get hit hard in 07, 08. So it is, we have a history pattern that that would happen. Do I think local stuff will happen? Absolutely. I, I just don't think you're probably going to travel as far for a tournament trail, depending. You're going to have to check your pocketbook a little bit there. Yeah. But yeah. then if you're talking about like just pure fishing, the biggest thing is just getting the next generation involved. I mean, you know, I did an episode uh, over the summertime with the DWR just talking about like, yeah, we are bread and butter's fishing licenses and they're going down. You know, they did peak there, but the problem is it's like getting the next generation. And that's when you project out numbers. We have a bunch of people, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s that get their fishing licenses. You don't see that in the sub 20 category, which hmm. is kind of like baseball ran into this issue because they're like, no one's playing. And when they get older, we're not going to have that crop because they're doing the NFL and all these other sports. And so I think what the industry is doing here, which is really unique was with, you know, the high school fishing and stuff like that. I think the tournament itch is a good thing, but I think they also need to do more clubs that are more wholesome for a lack of a better term it's just getting outside i did something called hooked on fishing not on drugs outside of dc where it was just like we just took you fishing that was it it was not a tournament thing there was a tournament organization i could then get into as a like gateway drug so to speak but it was just take people outside and fish that's what really needs to happen just to get people out and this is where it's interesting from the industry standpoint i get the tournament scene it's great marketing but just sponsor more events like that just to get your next generation involved because that's kind of scary when you look, I can give you my demographic numbers. I ain't pulling on like a lot of teenagers. I mean, it's, it's not. And that's kind of scary to see where that's going to go in the next 10, 20 years. I mean, I can tell you from my industry, the hard part for me, when I think about where I'm going to spend my money and where the ROAS is or the return on ad spend is, it's not with the, you know, 18 to 30 year old, but, transparently. The coffee brand that I work for on the price index is a 2.2x, which means it's 2.2 the cost of the average coffee on a shelf. Mm. We're looking for immediate returns. Like An 18-year-old that's in college, unfortunately, unless you are just an espresso fanatic or you are super into or regenerative agriculture, you're not going to buy from my brand. And I can't put money there because the return's not there. And the same thing goes for, you know, any big business, especially when you think about if if the business has capital behind it, any private capital or any funding that expects returns, they've got a hard time putting money into an audience that won't buy immediately. And that that's an issue. I mean, it's the same thing like your DWR point, like it's hard to advertise to a 13-year-old, right? You have to advertise to their parents because a 13 year old doesn't have dollars or even like a 16 or 18 year old. Like they've got a hard time. That is themselves. That is interesting to me because, and this will be, we're going to segue into marketing talks. Everyone else can just hang up now as I kill my numbers here. But, you know, I, from doing this and my business background, and then I worked with kids for five or six years when I was younger, a lot of it is. The, whatever the kids find cool, they pester their parents for. Um, classic example was that I, I thought was interesting is like Toys Toys R Us used to sell diapers because they knew they could get the parents in. They would always make the diapers cheaper. They lost money on it, but they knew they got the kids in there. They would drive their parents crazy until they bought something. Great strategy. How do you get the kid invested then? Or how do you get that younger audience invested? Because it can't just always be through the parent. And is there is that the secret sauce then? Is that the holy grail? Is how do you get the kids hooked? I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's, there's a balance. Like when you think about a, if we're talking brand specific, if we're talking about, you know, an industry specific, like we got to understand just in general where money gets put and how we can't think short term. Like so many businesses fail to think long term. I can give you a good example. Like, I spent at my last company around $8 million in ad spend and our return on investment was around 5x. So 
we made 5x that amount. So that's a pretty standard return, but we didn't really invest in, well, we invest in new customers. So like you mentioned, acquisition of new customers, but we weren't looking at audiences that were like, you know, 13 years old or even younger. Like we didn't even really make a lot of products for younger kids. Like I think the answer is, you know, advocacy. And like you mentioned, something programs like you're talking about like being able to be okay with your dollars to not give you money back immediately. And Growing a, lot, a community. A lot, of, a lot of issue with that is so many big companies, even in the fishing industry, the fishing industry is tiny, right? Mm. Are backed by private investment. Like these conglomerates, they expect to get their money back. Like it is yeah. hardball, man. You can't, take a couple million dollars from a private investment company and expect to tell them my forecast is X and then you don't deliver X. Like that, that's just not a thing. Like that's called bankruptcy. Yeah. That's, it's so fascinating. Cause like it is really, there's so many things you could pick apart there that, that it's, I think a lot of companies don't try to grow a community. And, and again, it gives that Chick-fil-A thing, like take care of the customer you have, grow that community because over time that'll compound because word of mouth is still the biggest, it, you know, word of mouth is the authenticity of the future. You know, it, it really is, especially yeah, but- when you get beat over the head with so many ads on so many different platforms, it, it's insane. But then it's also I, I, this idea that you need this other group because you learned that in school. And I don't understand, like, I what got beat over my head uh, in the MBA program, which I know there was, is like why you want women under the age of 18 and then that younger demographic, why that mattered so much. It's taught. I don't get it because it's like, I'm, I like the outdoor industry and I'm just going to, sad to say, spoiler, that demographic is generally something else, but they hit it that way. And I don't understand that mindset. Like, it has to be that way. Yeah. I mean, I don't have the golden... The yeah. golden answer, but I, I, I would have fully agree with you. I mean, it's it's community, it's thinking long term versus versus short term investment or short term return, and people have to understand that. Like long standing businesses have built a community, and there's a reason they stay around, and there's a reason that a lot of them don't have to spend as much on marketing as other businesses do. I mean, it's a One thing that I talk about in business all the time is show versus tell. Uh, uh, You want to show people why they should be a part of your brand versus tell them to be part of your brand. It's a push versus pull, right? Like you can't just say bye, bye, bye. Like no one responds well to that. Like, sure, you can put something at 25% off and they'll buy it because it's a good fucking deal. That's not how you grow loyal customers. And so many folks are just so, so focused on new customer acquisition, return on their investment. And that's not a long-term play. It's, it's, it is a problem because it's, especially when you had so many small businesses wiped out because small businesses, I tend to think will have more of a long-term horizon because they're in it for the long haul versus acquisition companies, things like that. Cause it's just about turnover next product. Um, and you see this in the movie industry too, where you have people that are just, just crank out a movie. We don't care if it's good. We just, we need to get something out that return on investment and stuff sucks because <laughs> you blend the artwork there with capitalism, which sometimes works, sometimes does, doesn't. Um, but I know, guys, if you're listening right now, you're probably like, what the hell are we listening to at this point? But uh, I think this is fascinating because it really gives you an idea about the industry. It's not just live scope bad, live scope good, but you can understand the thought process behind everything that goes in. Because to, to have the boat at $150,000, to have the live scope issues, you have to look at it from the other end of the spectrum. You're seeing the fruit of the tree, but you're not seeing the roots of where this thing grew from, how all this came to be. So always when you're looking at this stuff, really dig deeper into everything and even listen to some, you know, what's going on in the market. Cause all that stuff kind of matters with this. Um, Kyle, I mean, again, you know, I don't want to keep you for six hours. I mean, thank you so much for coming on. What do you have coming up and do you have any goals this year that you really want to try to accomplish in 2024? Yeah, I think like we mentioned, uh, I want to go pretty hard into the tournament side next year. I'm going to do 
all the cat James River stuff that I can do um, locally. I might do a little traveling, uh, potentially some BFLs outside of uh, Shenandoah and Piedmont series on the co-angler side, and maybe some smaller derbs as I'm I'm traveling. Like I'm, I've got some plans to hit Hartwell, Murray. Oh, I'll be in be Florida fun. for quite a bit this year. My parents are still down there, so just just see some places. My my kid's fourteen months old. I can't wait till he catches his first fish. I mean, that's gonna that, be cool. That's gonna be that's probably my number one. But I really want to dive deeper into tournament fishing and and keep learning. Like that's my that's my motto. There's there's really no such thing as a loss. It's really always a learn. That's awesome, guys. Please please check out all of his information link in the episode description you can follow him on instagram and anywhere else that he wants me to link in the episode description as well uh if you guys could go check out our patreon it would really help us out we're only 39 away from hitting our first goal and we're getting much closer to our overall goal of starting our nonprofit to help out the dwr and do supplemental stocking of our local waterways like subscribe to the channel we'll see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.